contrast to the exploitative forces that, whose plunder of the region's resources has imperiled the natural and human habitat. The instrumentum makes plain that the willingness of the ecclesial community to engage with its own need for conversion would determine whether its actions bolstered or diminished hope for the thriving of Amazonia. When an official document of the church gives priority to ecclesial conversion, it is noteworthy, not least because such texts tend to be circumspect or silent in this regard. As important as the candor, however, is the nuanced approach to conversion that the text employs. In addition to associating conversion with both a refusal to be complicit in destructive activities and a renewed appreciation of what it names the work of God in creation and its peoples, the document presents conversion as extending beyond a single action or a discrete moment in time. Conversion, as the instrumentum profiles it, is multifaceted, requiring, in its terms, unlearning, learning and relearning. These three elements constitute an enduring program for every endeavour that seeks to locate itself on the right side of history, the side that faith recognises as the province of grace. Taken together, unlearning, learning and relearning fashion a framework conducive to the ongoing reform and renewal of the Christian community, and so to more fruitful expressions of its mission. This lecture will explore how that framework can be an asset for the conversion of the church in every context. Conversion is an attractive ideal. It conveys a sense of freedom, possibility and newness. For this reason, narratives of conversion, from St Paul to Dorothy Day, have long fueled the Christian imagination, instilling confidence that the Holy Spirit, the ultimate agent of conversion, is persistent, thorough and efficacious beyond the limits that finite human imagination might impose. Trust in this spirit fosters expressions of hope that can be wholeheartedly committed to advocacy for change, not least in circumstances where this advocacy is unwelcome, but also steadfast in their refusal to concede the final word in the human story to darkness and failure. This hope also enables honest acknowledgement of the devastation that human sinfulness can wreak, including in and through the Christian community and its ministers. Such hope is necessary since no community or individual can close finally and completely the gap that exists between humanity's orientation to the fullness of life in God and the tendency to settle for less than God. Grace draws humanity towards the right side of history. But human beings and their activities are not the owner-occupiers of that space. Graced humanity is, but grace works within the complex history that reflects the not yet but already of God's reign. No human project, therefore, can validly claim exemption from the need for conversion. As appealing as are the outcomes of conversion, its processes are demanding, often daunting. Far from being a magical incantation, then, the Synod's unlearning, learning and relearning and title entail, as the instrumentum stakes explicitly, the practice of a critical and self-critical regard to find the attitudes and mentalities that prevent us from connecting with ourselves, with others and with nature. Honest self-examination can illuminate not merely obvious wrongdoing, 
but the more subtle, harder to detect forms of concupiscence that breed complacency, compromise freedom, and resist change. Since the product of a self-critical examination is not as immediately attractive as the carefully curated and Instagrammed self, individuals and communities may avoid conversion rather than embrace it. Nonetheless, escapist alternatives to the self-critical regard lack the productive potential associated with receptivity to the grace that undergirds conversion. Through the spirit, the call to conversion is conducive to freedom from the futile struggle to maintain the illusion of perfection. As a catalyst for liberation from a false self, graced self-criticism can cultivate, as the Synod's text emphasises, the capacity, quote, to weave links that connect all the dimensions of life and to undertake a personal and communal asceticism that allows us to cultivate a sober and satisfying life. Grace intertwines the dissolution of individualistic idolatry with a new appreciation of humanity's communal orientation. As is evident in the response of Zacchaeus to Jesus, this recognition illuminates the path of discipleship, the path of self-giving, that is simultaneously the path to the deepest self-realisation. Situated within an atmosphere of grace, self-criticism is an encounter with the merciful God, whose only agenda is to draw humanity more deeply into life-affirming relationships. The self-criticism that proceeds from grace differs radically from pathological self-denunciation or any other self-lacerating behaviours. Its outcome is fullness rather than humiliation, as the parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee illustrates amply. As it does for individuals, so too acceptance of the need for conversion expands and deepens the reach of grace in the community of the faith that constitutes the church as a living body of many parts rather than as an impersonal structure. The Christian community's willingness to acknowledge its failures and need for conversion can, paradoxically, manifest the activity of the spirit in the church rather than being testimony to its absence. Both scripture and the church's sacramental life, the two paradigmatic gifts of grace at the heart of Christian life and mission, stimulate conversion. A community of faith that trusts in the constancy of grace, that understands grace as reconciling and healing, can experience conversion as, in the assessment of Paul Murray, not a loss nor a diminishment, but a finding, a freeing, an intensification and an enrichment. The enduring wake of the sexual abuse crisis the background for this lecture, makes plain that the Amazon is not the only context of the church's life where self-criticism is required. In fact, this practice must have a home in every expression of the ecclesial community. This is so since the profession of faith about the spirit at work through the church exceeds the history of efficacious grace in each individual member all communities and every structure of the church. When Vatican II's Lumen Gentium, the Constitution on the Church, describes the church as a lasting and sure seed of unity, hope and salvation for the whole human race, it gives voice to the conviction that the church is never less than a graced community whose relationship to Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is more than a historical artefact. The same document, however, also identifies the church as a pilgrim, a community that must live by faith and not by sight. 
As a pilgrim in history, the church has, in the words of the Lumen Gentium, the appearance of this world which is passing, rather than that of God's fulfilled reign. Since the church in history will never be flawless and unfailingly consistent symbol of grace, the need for conversion is intrinsic to the church. The more the church internalizes this truth, the more this truth provide, pervades every aspect of ecclesial life, the less necessary will be reminders of it. Contrastingly, the sexual abuse crisis epitomizes the harm that accompanies both communal forgetfulness and sinful disregard of self-criticism and the need for conversion. The history of abuse and its cover-up brings into stark relief the suffering that afflicts innocent people when the actions of those who profess faith in God as the church's sole fulfilment contradict this creed. The breadth and depth of the damage that the church's consecrated ministers have perpetrated against vulnerable children and adults establishes the present crisis and as an unimpeachable witness to the imperative of the church's need for conversion. For this lecture, I will use the Synod's triad of unlearning, learning and relearning to explore the possibilities for a conversion responsive to this crisis. Unlearning, learning and relearning have an explicit, explicitly theological value as pertinent as they may be to manifold human enterprises. They can be instruments through which the Holy Spirit orients and constantly reorients the Christian community towards the right side of history and so away from all that suggests a group whose actions have an exclusively inward focus, indifferent to its impact on others. Only a church aligned on the spirit can fulfill Pope Francis's vision for a community whose members form a field hospital for the world's wounded. Conversely, the members of a church resistant to conversion will see themselves, as Francis describes, as arbiters of grace rather than its facilitators as people entitled to act in the world as though their pilgrimage were both complete and radiantly elegant. Thus far, legal and socio-political analyses have dominated the response to the abuse crisis. This is understandable, perhaps inevitable, since the crisis is the product not only of crimes, but of defective practices of authority in the church practices that sought to suppress knowledge of the abuse while denying justice to survivors and evading accountability to the law. As part of civil society, all agencies of the church are answerable to the law, but a converted church requires obedience to something beyond the law. It requires obedience to the spirit. It is the spirit who, as Vatican II framed it, moves the heart and converts it to God. Through the spirit, people of faith are able to face honestly the way in which the church's history and its present can constitute a counter-testimony to Christianity. Equally, they are able to pursue alternatives to these contradictions. Since the Spirit works to fulfil God's expressed desire to make all things new, efforts to eliminate demonstrated dysfunctions in the church, to develop the ecclesial community as a body of active members, and to respond to the challenges unique to the 21st century, can all embody the Spirit. The multiple forms of theological reflection directed towards these outcomes can also reflect the spirit-driven summons of the church towards the right side of history. It's important to acknowledge that invocation of the spirit and the turn to the theological have not always borne good fruit. Obfuscation or retreat into a nebulous mysticism that disassociates the church from life in the world are not unknown in the history of theology and spirituality. Such dangers remain, 
but are more indicative of the misuse of the spirit and theology than the guaranteed outcomes of their employment. At its best, theology, as Nicholas Lash expresses it, involves the stripping away of the veils of self-assurance by which we seek to protect our faces from exposure to the mystery of God. Understood in this way, theology itself is a work of conversion, one that cautions its practitioners against blurring the distinction between God and their ideas about God. It does so not because all such ideas are simply incorrect, but because they are always less than God, less than the truth into which the spirit leads. The possibility that theological reflection on the abuse crisis can be as hopeful as it can be forthright depends greatly on maintaining a focus on the truth that, that exceeds any particular grasp of it. Far from being a soft option, endeavours to be receptive to the spirit can prompt the ecclesial community to recognise that its still-to-be-completed pilgrimage can veer onto paths that spiral downwards into actions that conflict with the gospel. In this context, theology provides a stimulus to reform, not an endorsement of a self-congratulatory attitude in the church. In addition, the engagement with demography, psychology, sociology and a range of other human and social sciences that is characteristic of contemporary theological approaches to the church reminds the, the ecclesial community that the spirit transcends its borders. This reminder serves as a check on isolationist tendencies that separate the church from the world. A theological response to the abuse crisis recognises that the crisis is not simply an issue of governance, formation for ministry or pastoral practice, as implicated as are all three in the need for a converted church. The sexual abuse crisis gnaws at faith. It casts a pall of suspicion over belief in the capacity of any human enterprise, let alone the church, to mediate grace. For this reason, it signals the urgent need for theological analyses that are able not only to acknowledge all that blights the church, but to advocate alternatives from within the resources that the church claims as its own. As a later section of this presentation argues, such an approach does justice to the specificity of the church as a community of faith, while amplifying the centrality of discipleship to the identity of church. It accomplishes these goals without removing the church from scrutiny by the wider world. There is one further prefatory remark relevant to the theological analysis of unlearning, learning and relearning. While it is helpful for the sake of precision to distinguish the three moments constitutive of conversion, the three are interwoven such that each one implies the other two. Thus, unlearning creates the space for learning, which may involve something new but is often associated with relearning what can still be of value in what may have been subjected to neglect in the past and the present. In this interweaving of the elements of conversion, there is an echo of all that medical science and ecological awareness have taught us in recent decades about life as an organism. No single part is the whole but the whole depends on the health of the parts and on the health of the relationship between them. The wisdom of this perception ought not to be strange to believers in a Trinitarian God, nor ought it to be alien to thinking about the church. Accordingly, the effort to articulate how God is present in the world, including how God is present to each person, must emphasise the all-encompassing nature of God's Trinitarian presence in history. 
to reflect the comprehensive activity of the God who is the source and sustenance of all peoples and all times, the God who draws the whole of creation into a fulfilled future, the conversion of the church requires the conversion of requires more than the conversion of only one group or one particular way of acting at only one time or place. There can be no legitimate equivocation about the need for change in manifold facets of ordained ministry. But if change in the church is to engender renewed hope and vitality, it must be interconnected change, change that renews the discipleship of all members. In addition, spirit-driven change is less likely to involve wholesale demolition and rebuilding from scratch than it is to require the willingness to draw from the past to reform, that all, to reform all that shrouds the movement of the spirit at the present, as well as an openness to the future, the promise of which God alone can fulfil. And so to the unlearning. The unlearning required for the church's conversion has dominated recent discussions about change in the church. The revelations about clerical sexual abuse and its cover-up by the church's official have sparked multiple demands for the reform or abolition of numerous practices that have developed institutionalised forms in the church. The various demands may not always be identical, but they converge around the priority of unlearning the cluster of dysfunctions for which clericalism provides the caption. Similarly, there is a common emphasis on the required dismantling of the patriarchal and sexist, often misogynistic worldview manifest all too frequently in the words and actions of the church's ordained leaders. No less prominent as candidates for dismantling are the church's restrictive structures of governance, which, which consistently exclude from determinative participation in decision making all but the tiny minority of the church's members who are ordained. These topics are most especially highlighted in those parts of the world where participatory democracy is the norm and where there have been multiple decades of struggle against restrictions born of discrimination between races, classes, genders, physical abilities and sexual orientations. From the perspective of societies that have come to value not merely equality, but the richness that ge diversity generates, the church is an unwelcome anomaly. This status derives from a range of perceptions, such as the church is a body whose authorities are not accountable for their actions or inactions. The church is a body whose culture of secrecy thwarts transparency. The church is a body that mistrusts ideas that do not emerge from the dominant group. The church is a body where the emphasis on unity narrowly defined occludes the possibility of a fair-minded assessment of difference. The church is a body with a gulf between leaders and those who are to accept all that comes from above. Each item on that list, let alone the entire list, depicts the church as the negation of all that an open society treasures. The contrast between the church's internal operations and contemporary social values is not merely a, prop, a public relations problem for the church's leaders. The role that the church's governing structures played in, in the cover-up of sexual abuse is catalogued explicitly in the material on the Catholic Church in the final report of the Australian Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse, the report in 2017. In its consideration of the Church's organisation, the Commission recommended that the Catholic Church seek quote, ways in which structures and practice of governance may be made more accountable, more transparent, more meaningfully consultative 
and more participatory. In the agenda that the Commission details for the learning of the Catholic Episcopate, there is a clear implication that the Church's leaders must unlearn not only prevailing ways of proceeding, but the attitudes that underpin them. It is conceivable, likely probable, that Catholics at large, with the possible exception of the bishops themselves, would affirm enthusiastically the specific items that the Commission identifies as constitutive of a more open church. The same majority of Catholics may accept that the bishops' history of failure in relationship to transparency and accountability has resulted in the need for agencies beyond the church to become initiators of change in the church. What such intervention means for the integrity of the church as a self-governing body and whether it signals a new stage in the relationship between the church and the state are questions that will have an impact on the church's future, as Massimo himself has signalled in recent writing. From the perspective of a theology of conversion, the immediate concern that Commission's recommendations raises has less to do with religious freedom and the role of the state or with the likely efficacy of the proposed changes than it has with, with the notion of mandated change. Enforced change may ultimately facilitate a change of heart, may come to be perceived as a moment of grace, but they can also sit uncomfortably atop unreconstructed attitudes. In the latter situations, the mandated changes may even stiffen resistance to thoroughgoing reform and so fail to be agents of a broad and deep conversion. Since the most comprehensive conversions proceed from the inside out rather than vice versa, a, cha a fundamental change of heart must always remain the goal. Yet how is such change to come about? More especially, what mechanisms other than the interventions from beyond the church might facilitate the necessary unlearning in the church? Anger at the repeated failures and at times demonstrated duplicity of so many bishops has generated understandably a sense that there are no viable alternatives, alternatives to outside groups that only judicial or legislative authorities can bring about change in the church. This conviction is a clear measure of the loss of trust in the church's authorities. The damage done to this trust is a core element of the impact that continues to ripple out from the revelations of the long history of clerical sexual abuse. The church, and particularly the church's bishops, stand now alongside the big banks, big pharma, and many other big exploiters that are exhibits in a gallery of shamed institutions exposed as having no commitment except to their own survival, survival interpreted without regard to society at large. In the current atmosphere, an appeal to the church's capacities to self-correct, to be self-critical and open to conversion, will sound naive, perhaps troublingly misguided, not least because unlearning has so often been resisted by various segments of the church or stigmatised as the church succumbing to worldly values. On the other hand, unless the church's own resources can prompt and sustain self-criticism and reform, the church has no future. This is not to say that the church will simply cease to exist, although demographic trends are unfavourable on this point as well. Rather, a church unable to direct itself will cease and correct itself will cease to be a community whose defining features derive in their source, sustenance and fulfilment from an explicit relationship between baptised believers and grace. The emphasis on the relationship between the church and grace 
is not a ploy to place the church beyond any need for accountability to the wider society of which the church is always a member. It is, however, a way to accentuate what is particular to the church's identity as a community of faith. Integral to this particularity, to the church's dependence on the God who became incarnate in humanity, the God who continues through the spirit to be at the heart of history, is the instinct to oppose all that distorts the hope that the gospel engenders. Even more, this instinct must necessarily be a self-critical one, one that must home in first on life in the church itself before challenging social structures that imperil the well-being of the vulnerable. In short, the church's own resources not only enable unlearning, they require it. In this self-critical vein, Pope Francis warns that excessive centralisation in the church complicates the church's life and her missionary outreach. He amplifies that observation with the direct contention that bishops must allow members of the church, quote, to strike out in new paths within a church characterised by such freedom a particular obligation on bishops is to be attentive to more than, as Pope Francis says, simply those who would tell him what he likes to hear. A renewal of trust in the church's bishops may seem at present to be an unlikely prospect. If such a renewal is ever to be possible, it re will require that the church's authorities show by their actions that they can unlearn. This includes the need for bishops to demonstrate that they understand that the exercise of their office is not synonymous with either disregard of the dignity and rights of vulnerable people or separation from the communities they are to serve. The unlearning that may be required for the development of such practices will not distort the, offer, the office of bishops, nor impose extraneous interpretations on it, but correct what was itself the distortion of the authentic Episcopal role. An obvious objection to the claim that the church has resources available for unlearning and self-reform would be to ask why these resources were not effective in the past. Although this question defies an answer likely to dissolve the hermeneutic of suspicion, there are two responses that may till the ground for at least the seed of a different hermeneutic. The first is to recognise that the need for unlearning is contextual. It becomes evident when light arising in particular circumstances, often from beyond the church, illuminates dysfunctions in the church. This process is not indicative of an obstinacy unique to the church, but rather displays the irreducibly human reality of the church. Human beings in the church as much as elsewhere recognise the truth partially and over time, not in a single moment of insight. Today, the light generated by the need for accountability in the church has exposed the flaws inherent in certain styles of Episcopal leadership. Similarly, other lights are exposing the need for unlearning in manifold areas of the church's life, most, notab most notably the treatment of women in the church, where, as Pope Francis acknowledged recently, there has been, quote, a fair share of male authoritarianism, domination, various forms of enslavement, abuse and sexist violence. The second point arising from the church's history is that it is impossible to failure-proof the church. Indeed, from the moment that St Paul realised there was a need to write a second letter to the Christian community in Corinth, the church has not been free of dissension, division and numerous other ways of acting that contradict the urgings of the spirit. This fact is not an excuse for inaction, much less a tactic to minimise the reality of harm that these failures cause. 
but it too indicates an inescapable consequence of the church's existing uh, existence as a living body of human beings. The only perfect church would be a church without members, a church that would render incomprehensible both the incarnation and all expressions of embodied grace. Members of the church cannot legitimately retreat into the bumper sticker smugness of Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven, but nor can they ever outgrow their need for conversion and for the self-criticism that prompts it. This is indisputably true for bishops and priests who are perhaps the group with most to unlearn at present, but it is also true for every baptised person. To the extent that all members of the church focus on this truth, unlearning can become a communal activity. Since unlearning creates space, what fills the vacancy that flows from it? The 30th anniversary of the breaking down of the Berlin Wall provides an instructive backdrop for consideration of this question. The evolution from 1989 until today of various countries in the former Soviet bloc cautions against an unbridled enthusiasm that the end of a tainted system inevitably ushers in the millennium of unrestrained happiness and universal well-being. In fact, long before the rise of the nationalistic populism and xenophobic attitudes that presently scar so many of the nations that rejoiced at the end of Soviet domination, Jesus himself pointed out that, ironically, the removal of one demon may establish the conditions for the reigns of multiple demons. There is certainly a need to fill the space that results from unlearning and from the rejection of destructive practices, but filling it constructively, filling it in ways that demonstrate that that genuine conversion is taking place requires both vigilance and the willingness to learn. Vigilance is necessary to protect the longing for change from usurpation by anything less than a vision that stretches towards God's comprehensive vision. Learning is necessary in order to recognise that God's vision may differ from and certainly will exceed even the most cherished convictions individuals and groups may hold about their desired change. Without the vigilance and the learning, hopes for a brighter future can crumble as competing interest groups fight over the newly available space. So how and what do members of the church need to learn in order to produce a more hopeful, life-giving church than the one whose characteristics provided a base for clerical sexual abuse and its cover-up? What will help the ecclesial community to avoid a future marked either by schism or an escalation of the estrangements from the church that is now so glaring across multiple social groups. Consistent with what I've just been arguing about the limits of every vision, I will refrain from suggesting that Scheme X or Initiative Y offers the best way to restructure the church or to decentralise power and authority in the church. What I would propose is that all learning must begin with listening. As necessary as listening can be for learning, it is crucial to clarify what one hopes to hear. In this regard, Karl Rana offers an intriguing suggestion. Fruitful listening, he contends, requires being attentive to the perhaps possible possibility of a revelation from God. The perhaps possible possibility of a revelation from God. Rana is not proposing that the church go beyond the giving of self that has already, that, that God is likely to go beyond the giving of self that has already taken place in Jesus Christ or beyond what the Spirit continues to offer through word and sacrament within the community of faith and in a related way in the world of the everyday. 
Far from asserting any inadequacy in God's historical revelation or claiming that it is no longer pertinent, Rana's formula highlights an incontestable truth. Human beings have not and will never appropriate exhaustively all that God's presence in grace enables. This truth establishes the need for attentiveness to the possibilities that the spirit of the risen Jesus continues to unfold. Rana is not alone in giving priority to listening to God for being attentive to grace. Indeed, Vatican II's Gaudium et Spes, the document on the church and the modern world, identifies listening as the primary task for theologians within the community of faith. Theologians, it claims, are to hear, distinguish and interpret it, interpret the many voices of our age and to judge them in light of the divine word so that revealed truth can always be more deeply penetrated, better understood, and set forth to greater advantage. Pope Francis likewise acknowledging, acknowledges that listening can be a means by which the church as a whole might hear the Spirit speaking through young people, who might then experience the church as other than something moribund. There are times, Francis writes, when the church needs to regain her humility and simply listen, recognising that what others have to say can provide some help, some light, to help her understand better the gospel. A church always on the defensive, which loses her humility and stops listening to others, which leaves no room for questions, loses her youth and turns into a museum. In this regard, the listening process associated with preparation for the Plenary Council in Australia in 2020 is an important example. Rather than impose a top-down approach, the process for the Plenary Council began with a nationwide opportunity for people without discrimination to submit their views on reform in the church. These listening groups yielded a quarter of a million responses which have determined the priorities for the council. A church, on the other hand, that has become a museum is beyond the need for listening. It is also beyond the need for self-criticism and conversion since it has no capacity for life. A museum may offer a record of what God once did, but cannot engage with what the Spirit is doing and will continue to do. Listening not only subverts a sense that the church is complete, it reminds the ecclesial community of its pilgrim status, of the fact that it is movement, not stasis, that defines the church. In so doing, listening reminds the church also of its obligation to explore creatively responses to the challenges of the present. Of course, listening to the spirit in contemporary society is no simple matter. In the cacophony of the good, bad and the ugly that is the world of social media, and in the high era of hyper-partisanship that dismisses as fake news any truth that discloses the insufficiency of one's preferred worldview, does the spirit have a distinctive voice? If so, where do we hear today the call to the right side of history? Those who suffer, those who remind the strong and content of the vulnerabilities that they may prefer to ignore, may well be the clearest symbol of the spirit in the present day world. If this is so, it is a truth with definite implications for the need of the ecclesial community to hear the voices of survivors of clerical sexual abuse. It is survivors who unmask for all the members of the church the gap that exists between the what the spirit desires for the community of faith and the reality that often prevails. The voice of survivors becomes, therefore, not merely a summons to the compassion of the ecclesial community, but to its conversion. As Ebony Marshall Terman writes in the context of the Black Lives Matter movement, 
when ecclesial practices silence, invisible eyes, and demonize some, namely by racism, sexism, classism, and heterosexism, they smother the reality of the Holy Spirit that blows where it chooses as advocate for the outcast. Terman stresses that authentic listening to the Spirit has as its corollary the willingness to move in response to what is heard. Likewise, the conversion in and of the Catholic Church as that this move, moment of its history calls for being attentive to voices that current ecclesial practices invisibilize. This group includes the survivors of abuse as well as the many people who live on what Pope Francis refers to often as the fringes that members of the church tend to avoid. Authentic listening requires that action for reform, the movement that is a necessary part of listening to the Spirit, follows from such encounters. When it comes to the relearning that is integral to conversion, the preceding sections have cited repeatedly what is its most important feature. Relearning implies a continual return to the God who is different from humanity, even while sustaining human life. Unless this difference is kept in mind, Awareness of the provisional nature of the church's structure and practices loses its place to faulty convictions that all members of the church and all elements of the church's life are beyond the need for further pilgrimaging. More specifically, relearning the dynamics of the human relationship to God has implications for thinking about tradition, the, the category that functions often as a barrier to change. Here, the crucial task is to reclaim that the fullness of tradition is eschatological. This fullness applies only in God's fulfilled reign, rather than to any moment in human history, past, present or to come. As a community of, tra of tradition, the church must relearn in the wonderfully evocative phrasing of Janet Soskis, that to stand in a tradition is to, not to stand still, but to stand in the deep and loamy soil that feeds further growth. The deep and loamy soil that feeds further growth. It is incorrect then to evoke tradition as if the term gives permission to ignore new questions or to persist in business as usual, especially when the usual may pose an obstacle to the spirit. Consequently, as Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza highlights in relation to the treatment of women in the church, there is a need to guard against equating cultural and anthropological frameworks with the content, with the content of divine revelation. This danger is most acute when reference to tradition assumes uncritically that the term represents all that proceeds directly from God without the involvement of any human agents. A church willing to relearn that tradition involves human activity as well as God's activity, willing to relearn that tradition can inform the church's present while also summoning the church into the future that God shapes, will be a church that appreciates tradition as an instrument of reform as much as of, of preservation. Reappropriating the spirit at the heart of living tradition ensures that the church, as Sean Copeland argues, is able to repudiate all exclusionary symbols, values, criteria and practices, while also supporting creative initiatives in the developing, development of new symbols and practices in the articulation of new values and criteria for a life of human flourishing. If the ecclesial community is to do this effectively, it must relearn what it means to be a community of discernment, a community alert to the spirit. The capacity to discern, to hear and move in response to the spirit is at the heart of the church's DNA. 
It shines lustrously through the declaration of the first ecclesial gathering in Jerusalem that freeing converts to Christ from unnecessary burden has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Pope Francis has made a focus on discernment a principal theme of his time in office. For the Pope, the commitment to discernment is an integral aspect of discipleship. It is a way to discover again and again the God who is the opposite of the complacency that blunts the call to conversion. As Francis depicts complacency, it tells us that there is no point in trying to change things, that there is nothing we can do because this is the way things have always been and yet we somehow manage to survive. The opposite of this complacency and of the torpor that it induces is the willingness to be unsettled by the living and effective word of the risen Lord. Allied to Pope Francis's emphasis on discernment is his project to promote synodality in the church. This too is not a new direction for the church to move, but a relearning of what has deep roots in the Christian community, even if monarchical forms of government have overshadowed it in the more recent past. The focus on synodality echoes a renewed interest in the census fidei and the census adalium, all the baptized, those terms that focus on the spirit-driven capacity of all the baptized to recognize and respond to what comes from the spirit. Here too, learning and unlearning meet in the recognition that the church that the church listens to the spirit when all members listen to one another. Today's celebration of all saints stands in dramatic contrast to all that the sexual abuse crisis says about the church. The saints are those whose lives taken as a whole illustrate something of what it can mean to be on the right side of history. In the saints, grace has been efficacious. It has resulted in lives transparent to the spirit. The saints, in a rich variety of ways, present a life that is the opposite of what Pope Francis calls a dull and dreary mediocrity. For this reason, the saints embody an undreamed of possibility for love. One Luis Segundo's inspiring yet intimidating metaphor to express what grace can bring about through the church. The saints, however, were not born as such. They became saints through ongoing conversion. This fact can nurture hope for the present day church. Through self-critical reflection, through the unlearning, learning and relearning that conversion requires, and through a renewal of the discipleship that characterizes effective conversion, the church can be a more authentic embodiment of the good news it proclaims. This good news can change the world, but it must first and always change the church. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you uh, very much for your for your talk. You've given me a lot to think about. Um, I was very interested by uh, something you said uh, towards towards the uh, the beginning um, about about you know our the idea of the church is holy and how this uh, affects us when we hear uh, about abuse and then also you spoke about the importance uh, you mentioned this later on of of, of thinking of the church in her uh, pilgrim nature um, it, it made me think about uh, Carl uh, Rahner's uh, writings on the Church of Sinners and how that found its way into uh, Vatican II, uh, particularly uh, Lumen Gentium VIII, if, if memory serves. Um, and I was wondering, and I'm a little afraid to ask you this with Massimo here, because I just read an article by Massimo where he was questioning the sort of the language that some people use when they say, oh, well, Vatican II simply hasn't been received, and if it were received, then our problems you know, would be solved. But, but still, I, I do want to, to ask you, um, do, do, you th do you think that that we would be in a better 
place as a church if the if we had better received what Vatican II by appropriating our Rahner's understanding of the Church of Sinners was was trying to tell us. Okay, thank you. The let, let me make a, a few comments and just a, first a background about Rana wrote on that topic twice. Once at the end of the 1940s and then at, in the article he wrote after the council. And he, he was he welcomed the council statement but found it way too tentative uh, and for a few reasons. One he said it, it doesn't say what the church where the church is sinful, what it what its sinfulness consists of. A, and it he was also critical of the fact that the, that the council talked about a church of sinners rather than a sinful church. So he wanted the more direct naming of that, that sinfulness is not just about us who are members and you could have, you still have a holy church. It doesn't have any members in it, but it's still holy. Uh, so he wanted to, to, to be more grounded. I think one of the one of the things to grapple with here for, is the paradoxical nature of holiness. When we say we believe in a holy church, what, what are we saying? There's two things. One is we're saying it's about the Holy Spirit and not about us. You know, that, if you look at the sequence of the creed, it, it follows directly on talking about the Spirit. So it's the Spirit who's the abiding source of holiness in the church. Our appropriation of that is not about perfection. That's a bar we're not going to meet. But our appropriation of it is, I would suggest, the, the willingness to be converted. So the paradoxical nature of our holiness is that we acknowledge that is not a possession for us. The Spirit is a constant gift to us, but the appropriation of it is not something we get to the end of. And the more we own that then paradoxically, the more we're holy. And that's different from saying, oh, well, I'm just a sinner, there's nothing I can do about it. It is not that. It's taking seriously both the work of grace and my own resistance to the work of grace in me. Uh, and that's, that makes for a far more humble church to start with. Uh, not an embarrassed church, but a church that knows it needs God. Uh, our worst moments are when we've taken over God's role and filled it for ourselves. Uh, and that's why idolatry is the constant struggle of humanity from the first moment of, of humans' appearance in Scripture. Uh, so uh, the, the need for repentance, the need for conversion, is, not, is actually the means to holiness rather than that perfection is somehow the means to holiness. I often say to my students that there's no such thing as a perfect church. But if you want one, I will give you a three-part formula that will guarantee it. One, start your own church. Two, don't let anybody join it. And three, don't join it yourself. Do those things, you get the perfect church. Outside of that, you get the church we have, which is composed of complex people like us. The, the liturgical theologian Louis-Marie Chauvet has this wonderful phrase where he says, part of our struggle with the church is that we cannot believe that God would work through people like us. Uh, and yet this is where grace is. So it's owning that it is the work of grace, not our accomplishment. That the more we own that, then I think the more we, we are doing what Rana was advocating in his writing. So you sort of get at this with what you just said, but I want to raise a point that sometimes the way you use the word church, I find a little bit, I don't know, disconcerting. You know, the church should listen. And then my question is, well, who? Because there are a lot of us who have listened. You know, for example, I think a lot of the laity have listened to the experiences of these people who have been abused and have taken it really pretty seriously, which would be the church listening but who I don't think have really listened all that seriously are the bishops. And sometimes I think we use the word church in a way that obscures that. And I just want to sort of get your sense, you know, when you say the church should listen, I mean, obviously we all should listen, 
But in the context of the sexual abuse crisis, it seems to me the laity have been listening and have been ignored. And it seems to me that really conversion, historically, you know, I work on reform, and reform and conversion mean the same thing originally. <clears throat> conversion doesn't come from self-criticism so much as somebody else criticizing you. You know, a reform preacher, a penance preacher, somebody coming in and pointing out a principle. Now, those are people in the church. Like Francis of Assisi was a layman. He's like raising an agenda for reform. So I'm just wondering if you could address that a little bit. Sure, thank you. So a few things on what you said then. I, I, I was very careful at the start to, to make clear that when I was talking about the church, I was trying to include all of its dimensions. So each individual member, our communities, our structures. Uh, I, I certainly take your point that in, in the specific instance of talking about the abuse crisis, uh, it has been that the, 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 the failures of, of priests and bishops that have exacerbated that beyond belief, really. So I, I, I have no, no attempt to, um, you know, to conceal that. I, I still think, though, it is so important that we not lose sight of that, that we are to be a community of, of conversion. Uh, I, I think the danger of where we've been in some of our responses in the last 15 years is those people over there need to change. Uh, and absolutely, those people over there do need to change. But, but that leaves me off the hook. Uh, quoting Rana before, Rana has this wonderful thing where he says, there is no human judgment day. Uh, we all do judge each other, but none of it counts. Uh, only God in the end gets to judge. And I think because so, so much of the response has taken place, understandably, in the context of anger, some of that can get lost sight of. So I'm simply trying to recover that. Uh, your, your, your third point... Oh, sorry, just, can you just say again what you, the last point when you're talking about the history of reform... Oh, it's just that the, usually there's somebody... Oh, yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, so I think there, there can be definitely cata catalysts for reform that from outside, but in the end, I mean, that's the point I was making about the, the impact of the Royal Commission at home. Uh, unless the, the changes that the Commission has recommended, which make eminent sense, but unless that is also internalised, then, in fact... You, you might get the external changes, but uh, you don't get the change of heart. Uh, now, it, it, I can see the criticism go the other way. The change of heart has got to take flesh, uh, and I think that's true. So, if you like, I'm trying to hold all of these things rather than, than some of them. I've, you know, it's part of the Catholic genius, I think, is the challenge to keep as many balls in the air as, as, as you can at the same time. So any of us can keep one ball in the air. Keeping five and six going is what it is to be Catholic, I think. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, it's, it's overwhelming, but it's the only way that we actually even get a hint of doing justice to what the spirit at the heart of the church is about. So I, I, I think we would be very much on the same page. My differences would perhaps be of emphasis rather than of, of real major differences in content. Richard, the one thing I was struck with is the, the statement in, connected to this listening piece that you said the church listens to the spirit when the church listens together. And so, and I know that you said in terms of solutions that there's no one solution that will kind of bring us to some sort of resolution, one approach. But I was wondering, and, and I might tip my hat here with this question, but um, in terms of our human need to always bifurcate black and white, this and that, that group, this group, I'm wondering what you think about the approach of our rich tradition of contemplation in terms of that listening together as church. Thanks, Martin. I... I I, I'm absolutely happy to allow all sorts of possibilities. So just go back to that example I used about Australia. I, I mean, it'd be almost impossible to overstate 
the the impact of not just the abuse crisis but of of the the revelations of the royal commission i mean this was a sustained five year nationwide pulling off every strip of the bandage i mean it and the devastation has been beyond belief really that in that environment a quarter of a million people were happy to sit down and talk rather than just give up on all of this i find that just you know, extraordinarily powerful so listening to each other uh, the, the 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 listening to the lord you know listening to the spirit uh is not in any way at odds with that and can of course be the most powerful embodiment of it uh I wonder if, if, if it takes, there are stages in all of this, what, what you do first and what you can move towards. So I'm not sure that's a place where you can start and certainly start with groups uh, so much as it's a, it's a place you move towards. Uh, I mean, I don't, that, that's just a, a, a sense of it, but, uh, but uh, there's certainly a role for it as there is a role for so many other things. But there's moments for all of these things, I think. So I'm, I'm busy processing a lot of things. So this isn't going to be necessarily a coherent um, <laughs> question, I'm sorry to say. I, I'm wondering, as you talked about all the balls that a Catholic has to keep in the air, I'm wondering if you can talk at all about the ball of mercy uh, and, and what, how that functions in this process. Thank you. Can I, can I toss it back to you? Uh, would, would you like to maybe just say a little more how you're thinking about the context for your question, please? Sure. Um, I think that one of the, the um, great gifts that Francis has brought to the church has been to draw our attention back to mercy. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think uh, that what that actually looks like is is a, a great mystery. Um, I don't, and granted, I'm, I'm not an expert, but I also don't think that there has been enough said about this, apart from looking at Christ, looking at the life of Jesus, which is you know, the face of the Father's mercy, to use Francis's phrase. So, um, you know, and how, how, do we, how do we show mercy to the victims? How do we... Um, show mercy to the perpetrators? How do we, as a community, um, learn to show mercy to one another? Um, and, and to base all of this, instead of just simply out of outrage that is sin in, at its core, outrage that is merciful. Mm -hmm. um, so. Thank you, yeah. The, the short answer is, I don't know that there's a short answer. Uh, I think we have as a church in the last little while and more recently than would have been good learnt something about the need to be attentive to the victims, to the survivors uh, and to do that not, not at, I was at a conference last year at which a number of survivors spoke uh, and, and one of the themes I, was about that there has to be what people would call trauma-informed responses. In other words, to acknowledge the reality and not, not look, here's a good answer for you. Uh, so it, it's, it, it's allowing ourselves to be led in that way is, I think, the act of mercy rather than uh, assuming that we know what is best in that situation. In relation to the perpetrators, I think that is enormously difficult to know what constitutes mercy there. Uh, you know, all, all of our, if, if you like, wonderfully honed and, and quite wonderful uh, res, in, in, intuitions about forgiveness and so on, we also have to know that doesn't apply in, in an, a one-dimensional way here. That, that can't be what mercy looks like. Uh, that that little passage I quote at the very beginning from the uh, document for the Amazon where it talks about 
that any authentic change, and it's half a quote from there, and around it is a quote from Pope Francis in Laudato Si about how you treat the, the, the natural environment. And it says it's got to be about you know, learning new ways to, to act. So it can't be, well, we'll just be merciful and we'll forgive them or when they've done their time in jail, it's all over. Uh, it, it actually has to have a lot more dimensions than that about what does change look like here? What does a, a, a place in a community look like? Uh, I, I don't think as a church, and certainly not as a wider community, we are where those questions are, are questions that we're able to face yet. Um, I think the, the anger is just too, too, too fresh and too real. Uh, your, your point about what are we to do with each other, I think that's, that's probably the hidden thing about mercy that no one's asked at all, really. Um, it, can there be mercy for bishops? Uh, Again, I think the answer to that is complex rather than simple. And, and there's got to be a, a sense of that there's a desire and a willingness for difference. Uh, until all of those things are evident, uh, it's very hard to move in any direction, I think. Uh, uh, so uh, it's probably a wildly unsatisfactory answer, but I, I just think it, we, we are not at a place where the the elements of that answer. You, you might be able to name what it is we'd like to accomplish eventually. I just don't know that we're here yet. And so part of our conversion, if you like, at the moment as a church, is to be open to learn what mercy might look like, rather than assuming we already know the answer to that. So... Richard, I like your paper a great deal. You're balancing out of your sobriety, your, uh, your brutal honesty about the reality of the church combined with your great confidence in the power of God to be at work in the church. All, that's the great challenge right now for theologians, and you've done that well. What's, what's striking me, though, is the, the Richard that I've known in your writings, I don't know... I don't know if I've seen this much attention to this Holy Spirit. Now, am I I just edited a book on the Holy Spirit, so I probably got that. Ah, I, be, because I thought, this is, this is wonderful, and I, it, it's very much in, in sync with my own thinking on this, but you just finished a book. Well, okay, that settles mm. it. <laughs> Maybe you've answered it already. I, 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 I think about this. This is the third time in the last 12 months that I've, I've sat down in a really focused way to, to think about these questions. Um, and, and I think it, it, it's sort of where the only way I can even begin to not make sense of this, because I think it's beyond making sense of, but to actually find a way to say something that's not about merely despairing. Um, so I think that probably if you like the the work has pushed me here uh, in a way that 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 I'm immensely grateful for, really. Okay, so um, I really thank you for being here tonight. But before uh, we conclude, I have to thank the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences for making this possible. Uh, the president's office uh, for making this possible, my department, the Department of Theology and Religious Studies, the task force of the university on the sex abuse crisis, and I have to say I'm, <laughs> I'm thankful to the American Catholic Church because made uh, meet an Australian theologian and an Italian theologian <laughs> In the US, which which is a sign of hope for me, uh, and I want to thank you, especially Rachel and Nan, that has done an outstanding job as 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 being part of this idea of this series from uh, from the beginning, and so I just want to thank him especially and good night.